Oh, well, <coughs> let us get started. Uh, so the idea uh, on this retreat, as always, is the idea to uh, bring the suttas together with meditation practice. Uh, and uh, in my experience, it works quite well, because you, when you do your meditation, you feel a bit more peaceful and relaxed, and then when you read the suttas, you understand them better, yeah, and then when you understand the suttas better, often it also has an effect on your meditation practice. The two actually go together very nicely, yeah. and this is the idea with these kind of retreats. Yeah. And I have always felt myself that one of the main purposes of being a Buddhist monk, or a Buddhist nun, or any Buddhist teacher really, even Buddhist lay teacher, is to bring out the word of the Buddha. This is one of the main purposes of being a monk, yeah? Apart from your own practice, of course, which is uh, number one, it is actually to teach the word of the Buddha. Huh? And uh, I have always felt when I grew up as a monk that there was uh, too little of these kind of teachings in the world. Uh, there was a lot of teachers who taught from their own practice and own experience. And of course, that's good, yeah? That can be very inspiring and very nice. Uh, but uh, there was too little teaching that actually comes back to the very basis of what Buddhism is about, the word of the Buddha itself. Uh, that's why I prefer to use these as my uh, kind of foundation for, for teaching. Yeah. And uh, every year I try to have a little bit different theme, yeah, d uh, different kind of uh, focus. Uh, and this year I'm focusing on the Four Noble Truths. Uh, and the reason for that is because someone here asked me, where is that person? I cannot show anyway, it doesn't matter. Someone here asked me, can we you know, do focus on the Four Noble Truths this year? Uh, and it's always nice to get suggestions. I always welcome people to do that because it makes it easy for me. I say, okay, Four Noble Truths, okay, bang. You know, this decisions are always difficult, yeah? Oh, what should I do next year? Don't know. Someone tells, okay, you can do it. Uh, so, very, so thank you very much for that, for taking that burden off my shoulders. Uh, no decisions required. Uh, and uh, the Four Noble Truths is a very suitable topics in many ways. Uh, one of the reasons why it is suitable is because the entire Sutta Pitaka is really an aspect of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, so when, some, when this person said Four Noble Truths, I said, yay, now I can use any Sutta in the entire Sutta Pitaka. There's no limits because everything is part of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, so very easy to choose uh, suttas on that basis. Uh, but um, uh, also, of course, one of the reasons why it is very important, and we'll see that in a second, uh, is that this is the very first teaching of the Buddha. Uh, this is how he started out. Uh, and of course, when the Buddha starts out, the, you know, one of the main purposes of what he's doing, he's kind of laying down the foundation. Uh, this is what my teaching really is about. Uh, this is what I want to get across. Uh, yeah? This is kind of the framework of everything else. Uh, so for this reason, it is like the foundational teaching of Buddhism. Uh, and everything else kind of fits into that, as I was saying just a minute ago. It's all part and parcel of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, and uh, if you have any doubts about that, you can just almost look at any teaching in the Sutta Pitaka, and if you don't understand how it fits into the Four Noble Truths, well, I, I can explain it to you. Uh, yeah, it is not that hard to understand how it all fits in to these Four Noble Truths. Uh, and um, just to give you an idea, just, just before, just later on, we'll have a look at the First Noble Truth. Uh, yeah, and in, in the First Noble Truth, it says that the five aggregates, the five khandhas, the five personality groups, or whatever you want to call them, that these are part of the first noble truth. Yeah, so right there you can see how the five khandhas are part of the first noble truth. Now, then you have the six sense spaces. It's another kind of uh, famous Buddhist teachings on what to investigate. Well, that is just another way of talking about the five khandhas. It's about your personal experience of things. That also part of the first noble truth. Yeah, and then you have uh, Things like the uh, uh, the Bodhipakya Dhammas, which we talked about last year here, which are all the uh, aspects of the Buddhist path. Well, that's all part of the fourth noble truth, the path. Uh, yeah, and then you have Buddhist teaching like dependent origination, which you find throughout in the Nidana Sangyutta, in the Sangyutta Nikaya of the suttas, the connected discourses, uh, they fit into the second noble truth. Uh, yeah, so it all fits together in this way here. And it's pointing, showing, showing you why these are all, how all the teachings actually are part of the first, uh, no, or the four noble truths. Uh, 
So that's why they're very all-encompassing and very useful in this way here. But there is another reason why the Four Noble Truths are so interesting here. And this is why, because they are really the right view or the right outlook in Buddhism. If you want to understand how to think about the world, how to look at the world, uh, how to um, uh, look, look at reality, if you like, what reality is like from a Buddhist perspective, uh, that reality from a Buddhist perspective uh, is really what the Four Noble Truths are about. Uh, this establishes the outlook. Uh, yeah? what, is, what is life really like? What, our, what is our experience like? What is the right way of thinking about uh, uh, this whole thing that we call life and existence, its purpose, its meaning, uh, why we are here, and all of these kind of things. Uh, all of that is part of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, and uh, for this reason, it is very important. It is really foundational. Uh, why? Well, because everything in Buddhism starts out with right view, uh, right understanding. Uh, the Noble Eightfold Path begins with right view. Uh, yeah? If you haven't got that right view, if you haven't got the right understanding, nothing happens. Uh, yeah, you, become, you become just like most people. You run around your life, you run around doing this, doing that, uh, and then one day you're on your deathbed, you think, oh, that was so fast. What happened? Uh, where am I? What, you know, what have I been doing all this life? Oh, and you forget all of this. Yeah? And it comes, suddenly one day, bang, you're there and you're about to die. And then, of course, it's too late. You can't really practice the Noble Eightfold Path on your deathbed. Uh, yeah, maybe you can try, but <laughs> it's a little bit too late. It's good to start a little bit before that. Uh, otherwise, it's problematic. Yeah? So right view is what points us in the right direction. Uh, Right view is what makes a spiritual path uh, possible. Without it, there's no spiritual path. Uh, nothing really happens without that right view. Uh, and not just that, but that right view, the more you think about it, uh, the more you develop it, the more you kind of agree with that right view, the more you align your ideas with the ideas of the Buddha, uh, the more powerful that path becomes. Uh. So a large point of this, yeah, of this retreat, is to kind of start to try to think like the Buddha. There was a um, fellow who drove me yesterday, yesterday and he said his, his family name was Fu. Yeah, Chuan, Chuan, Chuan Wai Fu. Yeah, Fu, Fu Chuan Wai. Yeah, and uh, I said, it's better if your name is Fu, I said. Uh, yeah, because Fu is the Buddha, it's the awakening. Uh, yeah, so you should change the name from Fu to Fu. Yeah, it's better. <laughs> Because that is kind of the idea, yeah, for is that then you have the kind of the awakened mind, you have the right outlook, and then the path really happens. Because I asked him, are you going to come on this little retreat? He said, oh, no, no, no time, yeah. I've asked him the same thing the last five years, because he always drives me every year, oh, no, no, no time, too many things to do. And then one day you wake up on your deathbed, you think, oh, what happened? Uh, Look, okay, now it's too late. <laughs> Anyway, so right view is so fundamental and so important for this whole thing. And uh, even if we just talk about right view all the time, actually it is very, very useful because this is what then allows the path to progress, allows the path to come out and to actually happen in your life. And one of the most important things for you to do is actually to remind you of the aspects of right view in daily life, yeah? All the time to come, coming back to the Dhamma, listening to Good Dhamma talks really is about reminding yourself of right view. Uh, yeah, what really matters in life? What is actually important in life? Uh, yeah, what, what at the end of the day, what sh how should I be spending my time? How should I be spending my life? How am I going to maximize happiness, contentment, joy, all of these things, and minimize suffering in life? Uh, what is it that really matters? Uh, and this is what right view is all about. Uh, and this is why the Four Noble Truths are so interesting because they kind of give rise to this right view here. So um, that is uh, uh, the idea and uh, uh, as you have seen on the schedule there's quite going to be quite a lot of uh, uh, sutta readings uh, during this retreat and that's okay uh, I think this center is kind of suitable for that uh, there will also be a little bit more meditation in the middle uh, but on the ends there will be more uh, more looking at the suttas and the word of the Buddha and with a meditation in the morning and in the uh, late afternoon or evening uh, and apart from that there will be sutta readings uh, so, but now I want to start off on these uh, four noble truths. Uh, 
And uh, the, uh, probably the most important of uh, the suttas that talk about these Four Noble Truths is the famous Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta. Uh, it is found in the uh, Sangyuta Nikaya. Sangyuta Nikaya is co often called the Connected Discourses of the Buddha. Uh, and uh, uh, this is one of the collections of Buddhist teachings. Uh, and this is the 50 six of these collect of the Sangyuta Nikaya, the, the 56 like little books. This is the book number 56, Sutta number 11. Uh, if you have you got your have you got that little booklet in front of you? Uh, you see the little number? Uh, this, this booklet is bigger than yours and the reason why it's bigger is because not just because the text is larger because I have the Pali on the side as well. Uh, so this was this was uh, Wa Yin who actually did this for me so she did put all the Pali in there for me. Uh, I didn't ask but she just did it. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then she did something interesting. If you look here, the, I, I just noticed that uh, this morning, this is a table of contents at the beginning here. Have you got table of contents as well? Yeah. Now, the, so the table of contents, both in Pali and in English, yeah? So in English it says contents at the top. Uh, on the Pali it says matika. Now, how many of you knew that matika is the Pali word for contents? Only one, yeah. Only <laughs> probably only Wa Yin who knew that. So that's kind of quite impressive. I thought, I thought, wow, she really. That's quite uh, quite amazing. Matika in Pali means like a, a list of things, yeah. And uh, a list in terms of content is basically what it means. So if you lo look at the Abhidhamma Pitaka, it has all these matikas, these lists uh, that reminds you of the content of the Abhidhamma, etc. So this is where it comes from. Uh, so that was, I was quite uh, surprised to see Matika at the top of the page. <laughs> that was very interesting. Anyway, so uh, many of the things I am going to say, I may use words like the Sangyuta Nikaya, connected discourses of the Buddha, and all of these things. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, please let me know. Yeah, there is a microphone in the middle of the floor there. You are welcome to ask questions at any time. I don't really mind. I'm not going to be try to get too sidetracked by question, we try to keep it to a kind of, a, not too many, but you are welcome to ask as we go along, so we can catch any problems as they arise. Uh, uh, I think that can be quite useful, as long as it's not too much. Uh, and uh, so, is there anyone here, if I s say the word Sangyuta Nikaya, who has no clue at all what I'm talking about? Uh, is anyone who, everyone knows what Sangyuta Nikaya means? Uh, everyone? Well, you are so educated. That's a <laughs> That's amazing, yeah, yeah, astonishing. Uh, usually 90% say, oh, I don't know what you mean, yeah, but actually you know what I mean. Uh, that, uh, yeah, this must be Jeff, must be very, working very well, Bobby. Uh, um, <laughs> doing a very good educating people. Okay, Sangyuta Nikaya, so connected discourses. Uh. So um, this is the very first sutta of the Buddha, and for that reason it is uh, particularly interesting. Uh, and I'm going to go into it a little bit, uh, and then uh, we'll see what comes out of this. Uh. So, this is how it starts. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Benares, uh, in the deer park at Isipatana. There, the Buddha addressed the group of five mendicants. Okay, so let's stop there. So, mendicant, have you heard that word before? Yes, you have? Okay, so those of you who were here last year, you would have heard it before, because we talked about this last year as well. And uh, mendicant is this ancient English word that nobody uses anymore. The only person who uses it is Ajahn Sujato. So straight away you know this is Ajahn Sujato translation because uh, it has the word mendicant. Uh, but mendicant basically means the same as bhikkhu or bhikkhuni. It means someone who relies on arms. Yeah, this is kind of the idea of the word mendicant. Uh, and that's why Ajahn Sujato uses it. Uh, and also because it is gender neutral. Yeah, mendicant includes both nuns and monks. And uh, so that is kind of the nice thing about it. It takes away because the suttas are usually phrased in terms of monks all the time. But uh, a lot of them were also given to nuns. Yeah, and sometimes you can see that. You can see the different traditions. They have nuns and monks. Some have only monks. Uh, varying depending on the situation. But monks is like a convention, and that's why they put monks in front. But mendicant being gender neutral is kind of nice, because the Dhamma is for everyone. The Dhamma is not for 
just monks, yeah, lay people and nuns, they don't count, yeah. <laughs> it is not really like that. Everyone, this is for everybody here, yeah? and for that reason to make it more inclusive. Uh, that's what that is all about. Uh. So um, the Buddha was staying near Benares, uh, modern day Varanasi. Uh, yeah, I know that some of you have been to India, right? Uh, yeah, you've been to Benares, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, you, so Benares, when you go there, you get the feeling that it's almost two and a half thousand years old. Is that right? Uh, yeah, you get, you get <laughs> it feels very old when you go there. Uh, so this is such an ancient city of India. And of course, you can go to the Deer Park. It says here, uh, in the Deer Park at Isipatana, you can go there in the present day. Uh, and actually, it's quite beautiful, the Deer Park in Benares, uh, uh, Saranat, just outside of Benares. Uh, uh, it has large kind of lawns, yeah, grassland, there's large kind of Indian trees, these Indian fig trees with enormous branches uh, and uh, it is enormous stupas uh, uh, and uh, quite, a, quite a peaceful and nice place except for it's getting very touristy with all the Buddhists there uh, but uh, apart from that it's actually quite a beautiful place in India and you can imagine why the Buddha would have gone to a place like that uh, especially because at that time probably no tourists there yeah because it was before uh, before there was any Buddhism in the world uh. it's amazing how noisy Buddhists can be here uh. it's only Buddhists who go to these places uh. Buddhists can be really noisy here uh. have you noticed that uh, you go to these places in India and the Buddhists come and you think oh no so too many Buddhists uh, please please don't come this way because it's nice and quiet here before you come <laughs> <laughs> So they have loudspeakers and they have kind of 10 bus. I remember when I w went to Vesali a couple few years ago, there was in one place there was 10 busloads of Koreans coming here. And these Korean Buddhists were also, because 10 busloads is about 300 people, yeah? It's very hard to make 300 people be quiet. So it was very, very, very kind of uh, yeah, interesting here. <laughs> so, but. Uh, Basically, these places are, if you go there at a good time, you can get some feeling for what it was like at the time of the Buddha. Yes, yeah? so you can get feeling for some of the power, some of the seclusion, uh, some of the beauty of these places and why the Buddha would have been there. And that can be very inspiring here. Yeah? This is part of the thing about being a Buddhist, to go sometimes on to India uh, on a pilgrimage to get a feeling for these places, uh, because they can be very powerful. Uh. Yeah, when you sit in a place and you know the Buddha sat here, uh, imagine sitting on the se same seat as the Buddha. It's almost f scary, isn't it? Uh, the Buddha sat there, oh, do you know, should I sit here? Do I deserve to sit on the same seat? Uh, and you sit there and you kind of get a feeling for what it was like. You see the same view the Buddha, th Buddha saw and all of these kind of things. Uh, and it kind of draws you, makes you appreciate the Buddha more because you understand uh, the circumstance, the situation, the landscape uh, and all of these kind of things uh, that you found, found, uh, find in these kind of places. Uh. So this is the Deer Park at Isipatana, and you will notice that on some Buddha statues, uh, you see the Buddha having a, he holds his hand a bit like this. Uh, have you seen that? Uh, yeah. And this, when he holds his hand like this, this is this is the symbol of setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. The Buddha has many symbols. Yeah. There's kind of the the Abhaya, the fearlessness symbol, the generosity symbol, and all these kind of things. It's called mudras. Uh, but the, one of the famous ones that relate to this place is, the, is this one here, which is like the Dhamma Chakka Pavatana symbol, setting in wheel, the uh, setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. And if you look at those Buddha statues where the Buddha is presented like that, very often on the bottom you will see deer, carved deer on the bottom. Uh, yeah, and not only deer, but there will often be five monks there as well, uh, yeah, at the bottom. Uh. Actually, sometimes there's six at the bottom. Uh. You know why there's six? Uh? There's the Buddha on top and there's six on the bottom. The six, on the f the six are the five monks and the donor, the one who paid for the, st for the, the statue. Uh. Yeah? <laughs> that's the sixth one. <laughs> That's what they say anyway. I don't know. That's, what, that's kind of the, the idea. So, so, so this is how, how, it, how it works. <laughs> And uh, so then you re recognize straight away this Buddha statue relates to the Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta, the setting in motion, the wheel of the Dhamma. That's what it is all about. Uh. So uh, this is where the Buddha addresses this group of five monks. And of course, the group of five monks or mendicants, uh, 
they are the monks that looked after the Buddha before his awakening. I don't know if you know the story of the Buddha. He had these monks looking after him before his enlightenment. And now he's teaching these same monks later on. So what is he teaching these monks? Let's have a quick look at the very first line, what he's teaching them. Mendicants, these two extremes should not be cultivated by one who has gone forth. What two? Indulgence in sensual pleasures, uh, and the other one, indulgence in self-mortification. Uh, I'll come back to the explanation in a second. I'll just stop there, first of all, to have a look at these so-called extremes, yeah? These two extremes. Uh, and um, the, f the first point here is the question of what, why is it called extreme? Yeah, the whole world indulges in sensual pleasure. Everybody likes that. How can, how can that be called an extreme? And self-mortification, okay, you can maybe understand why that is an extreme, because it means like torturing yourself and all of these kind of things. Uh, but I'm not sure if extreme is really the best translation for this word. The Pali word is anta, and anta means like an end. Yeah, it's an end of something, like an end point or uh, something like that. Uh, and I think maybe two opposites is a better translation here. There are these two opposites, uh, yeah, sensual indulgence on one hand, uh, and then self-tormenting on the other hand. Uh. So this is the very first teaching of the Buddha, yeah, these two extremes, and then after that, the middle way, the thing which goes in between, if you like, those two extremes. Uh. So why is this the first teaching of the Buddha? This is the very first one, it's very interesting, yeah? Why does the Buddha say this at the very beginning here? Yeah? And one of the reasons why he says this at the very beginning is that this is revolutionary. Yeah? To us it may not sound all that revolutionary, I may sound, okay, well you heard this many times before, yeah? and you probably wonder why am I reading this out anyway, I've heard this many times before. Yeah? This is a revolutionary teaching. So the Buddha is saying basically that uh, the world has been practicing like this before. This is the way the world has always been working. Uh, now I'm going to teach you something different. Uh, yeah, it's very hard for the Buddha to get this teaching going because it's very profound. Uh, it's all about insight into non-self, into insight into dependent origination, all of these kind of things. Uh, it's a very profound teaching. Uh, how are you going to be able to get these people to understand? Well, the first thing is to make them understand why everything before is wrong. Yeah, why it doesn't work. First of all, you put that aside and then you come to the new teaching. So this is the revolution, this is the Buddhist revolution that's happening right here. The Buddha is saying, there's something new. I've seen something amazing. Yeah, this is real awakening. Listen, this is what he's saying here. Why is he saying this? And to be able to understand this, I will go back a little bit back in time now before the Buddha's awakening experience, uh, and to see what actually leads up to this. Yeah? And you may remember the Buddha, he started out, he lived the life of luxury at that time. Yeah? He, he wasn't the prince or anything like that, that's just later exaggeration. There's nothing really about that in the suttas, but he did li live a very kind of comfortable life. Yeah? And he, uh, in the suttas it talks about he had the best kind of clothes and he had a a lotus ponds and he had a, a three houses, one for the winter, one for the summer, one for the rainy season, and he had all these musicians and all this kind of stuff. So he was obviously enjoying himself, yeah, like a, uh, in, in a very good way, like, like people enjoy themselves at that time. Uh, it's a bit different from now, yeah, lotus ponds and that sort of thing, it's a bit different from Xboxes or whatever they have now, but uh, you know, it's just still enjoying yourself in sensual realm, it's all sensual, uh, yeah. So one of the things it says about the Buddha there is that he spent three months of the rainy season surrounded, all surrounded by female musicians, female entertainers. Uh, yeah, so it's very obviously it's kind of relating to sen the sensual realm. He had the best kind of food, uh, the best kind of clothes, yeah, best kind of entertainment, all of this relating to the sensual experience of the world. Uh. So the Buddha has this experience and then one day he realizes that this is dangerous. Uh, there is a problem here. Yeah, I need to. Uh, this is not actually leading anywhere. Uh, it all leads to death uh, at the end of the day. How can I keep on indulging when all of this eventually leads to separation, to death, uh, and to having to abandon all of these things? Uh. So he gives up uh, sensual pleasures uh, as problematic. Uh. 
And then what does he do? Well then, because he lives in India at the time when the idea of self-mortification and tormenting the body, that is the spiritual path that everyone does. Especially the Jains. The Jains was, were famous for just practicing self-mortification to an extreme. So the Buddha does the same thing here. Yeah, he also practices self-mortification. And it takes this. It's not the Buddha yet. I should say the Buddha to be. Uh, he takes it to, the, to an extreme whereby he almost dies from tormenting the body, from eating so little, like one rice grain a day and all of these kind of things. Yeah? Going through all those torments that the Jain ascetics also went through. So the Buddha may have, the Buddha to be, he may have been almost like a Jain ascetic yeah, at that particular time. Yeah? A very similar way of living, living his life. And he takes it to death's door. He almost dies from all of this. Yeah? Yeah, and he knows I can't take it any further. Huh? If I take it any further, I will die. Huh? So what to do? Huh? I've given up the sensual pleasures. Huh? Now I've taken the spiritual practice of the present day, the self-tormenting to an extreme. Huh? I've done, uh, uh, now that doesn't work either. Huh? What should I do? Huh? And at that point, and this is a very interesting, I did read it out here last year when I was here, found in the Maha Satchaka Sutta, uh, Majjhima Nikaya number 36, uh, and then the Buddha says, could there be another way to awakening? And at that point, he thinks back to experience he had as a child. As a child, he was sitting under a tree, chilling out. Yeah? He wasn't doing anything. He didn't know anything about meditation practice. It's kind of really interesting. He didn't know anything about meditation. He had never been taught meditation by anybody. He was a child. Yeah? Just a young boy. He doesn't say how old he was. Maybe twi- you know, He was a sitting in the shade while his father was working. So presumably he was too young to take part in the work. Twelve years old maybe. Who knows? And as he did that, he entered a jhana experience. Yeah, and now he thinks back to that jhana experience he had as a child, and he thinks, could that be the path to awakening? Yeah. Now this is interesting for many reasons. One of the reasons why it is interesting, it shows you that here the Buddha to be automatically goes into a jhana. He doesn't need any teachings. Yeah, he just sits at the root of a tree. He just chilling out, doing absolutely nothing, just relaxing and then automatically goes into a deep meditation experience. And that tells you a lot about how these meditation experiences are achieved. Yeah, don't have to do anything. He's not watching his breath even. He's not doing anything, he's just relaxing. And when you really relax properly, and your mind is in a good frame, you have a positive state of mind, all of this, and this is a natural consequence of just relaxing. And this is w- shows you that the vast majority of people, when we do our meditation practice, uh, we do too much. Uh, yeah, you must watch the breath. Uh, you must watch the body. Uh, you have to get rid of the hindrances and defilements and all of this. Uh, and all that doing activity uh, very often gets in the way of uh, uh, success in meditation. Uh, yeah, which is so. This is how tells you a little bit about how simple meditation actually is, uh, how little is involved in terms of doing things. Uh, and all you do is have to just be there, be relaxed, have the mindfulness, uh, be in a good state of mind, and then it happens automatically. Uh, it's fascinating, isn't it? Uh, and it, this really is a pointer to how we should approach meditation practice at the same time. Uh. But then uh, the Buddha to be thinks, could this be the path to awakening here. Yeah? Yeah? And then he realizes, he says, well, why am I f- afraid of that happiness uh, that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures? Uh, and then he uh, says, I am no longer afraid of that. Uh, and then he practices those jhana experiences, uh, and that, of course, is where the awakening happens. Uh. So this is the background, yeah? this is the background story. And then of course when that awakening happens based on that jhana experience, uh, then the Buddha thinks, well, who should I now teach? And then he thinks about Alara Kalama, Uddhaka Ramaputta, who were his uh, first teachers, uh, and they have already passed away, so it's too late, uh, yeah? can't teach them anymore. And then he thinks about his five companions. Uh, yeah? And his five companions, they had already left him at this point, uh, And the reason why they had left him is because the Buddha-to-be had decided to take some food. 
yeah, I'm going to take some porridge, some very simple food. And then the five companions said, oh yes, you are backsliding. You are going back to luxury. He had a little bit of porridge. You're going back to luxury. Imagine. Yeah. So demanding, yeah, these people. Yeah, just a little bit of food, just to kind of make your body work. And that's enough to go back to luxury. So it's really kind of over the top. So uh, they leave the Buddha. Yeah, even though this is actually the basis for the Buddha attaining awakening. With that porridge, with that little bit of food, he's then able to meditate properly. If you are too emaciated and too thin and too weak, you can't even meditate because uh, it's just the b body is too weak. The body has to be middle way, yeah? No suffering in the body, otherwise it doesn't work out. So then he decides to kind of go find his five companions. He walks all the way to Benares, to Varanasi, yeah? and then he teaches these companions. Yeah? And this is why he starts off in this way, by talking about the sensual pleasures and the, uh, uh, the self-mortification. Self-mortification just means tormenting yourself. That's really what it means. Uh, Mortification comes from the idea of death, yeah, Mort mortal, uh, the idea that you're trying to almost like kill the body, mortifying the body, get rid of the body. That's where that word, word comes from. It's a very unusual word, uh, used kind of specialist word, uh, but it's like tormenting the body so the body kind of gets out of the way. That's kind of the idea behind that. Uh. So that's the story, and this is why this starts out. The Buddha has to lay down uh, a new way of looking at the world. Uh, a new view of reality, a view that didn't exist at the time of the Buddha. Uh, that is what is coming out here. This is why this is so important. Uh, and uh, the problem is that the vast majority of people, yeah, when we come into existence, we come into existence because, usually because we have wrong view. Uh, this is why we kind of carry on yeah, as human beings. Uh, and because we start out with wrong view, we have to kind of be directed in the right way to make that view straight. Uh, this includes the monks of five here to enable us then to practice this path properly. Uh, wrong view is kind of part and parcel. It's kind of the uh, thing you get with you as you get born into this world. Uh. So. Um, that is the background to this. this. That's what's happening here. And then the Buddha talks about this, yeah, and he explains what the problem is with these things. Uh, and uh, you says he says he talks about indulgence in sensual pleasure, which is low, crude, ordinary, ignoble, and pointless. Uh, that sounds a bit harsh, doesn't it? What's wrong with enjoying your food? I, I want to enjoy my food. I don't want to. This sounds terrible. Uh, so. What is, th what is this? So first of all, let's just have a look at these words. Yeah? I, have, I have analyzed this before, but it's interesting. So I want to kind of look at it again. Low, the word for low is hina in Pali. Yeah? And uh, you may know the word hina. Hina is the same word as in hina yana. Yeah? It, so it means like inferior or low. And uh, that is how it was used polemically in the old days when they had discussions between Mahayana and Hinayana. Then the Mahayana would disparage the Hinayana by calling them the low or inferior vehicle. And that is the word they would use for that. Uh. But in the suttas, it is sensual pleasures that are called low, yeah? inferior if you like. Yeah? Why are they called low? And uh, they are not called low because uh, we should never enjoy anything in the world. That's not really what it means. Uh, it means they are low because there is something better. Uh, yeah, that's the point here. There is possible to raise the mind up, to experience something superior, uh, and that's why they're called low. So you have inferior and superior pleasures, uh, and you want to move the mind to more superior pleasures. Uh, isn't that right? Uh, makes sense. The, if you can choose between small pleasure and high pleasure, what would you choose? Uh, most people would choose greater pleasure, yeah? It kind of makes sense to have more pleasure rather than less pleasure. If you have access to more pleasure, most people would say, yay, I'll take the, take the higher pleasure, thank you very much. Uh, yeah? They won't say, I'll go for the low ones. Why? Because it's more pleasurable, it's just natural. This is how we are driven as human beings, towards more pleasure. We want to avoid suffering and we want more happiness. That's just the nature of things. Uh. So there's nothing wrong really with sensual pleasure as such. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, at least not with this word, it just means that they are not the best kind of, the highest kind of pleasure, yeah? Crude. Uh, what is the word for 
crude here again. Oh, actually, I actually have the Pali right here, so this is very handy. <laughs> Gammo, yeah. Gammo means of the village. Yeah, so ordinary. Yeah, this is, this is what hap village happiness. Yeah, in other words, ordinary happiness, what the ordinary people have. That's what it means. So, ordinary happiness, what everyone can expect to have in this world, is this kind of happiness. Crude, ordinary, ordinary, portujaniko. Uh, Portujanako is like the ordinary person. Putujana, putujana, portujaniko, of the ordinary person. This is what ordinary people have. Uh, yeah? What is the difference between ordinary people and what, are the, what is the opposite? The opposite is the Aryans, the noble ones, exactly. Yeah. So the noble ones have access to a higher happiness. It is not the happiness of the village, but the happiness that is higher up. So again, this difference between lower and higher happiness that you see here. And it is ignoble, so an area, not of the noble ones. And it is uh, pointless. And this is one of those very u nice little translations here by Adan Sujato, the idea of pointless. Uh, the Pali word is anatta sanghita. And atta in Pali means like uh, the purpose or the goal of something. Uh, you have like the Dhamma, which is the teaching, and the purpose of that Dhamma is the atta, the goal, the benefit, if you like. Yeah? The atta is where we're heading towards. Uh. So this here is pointless. It has no goal. It has no purpose. It's not going anywhere. Yeah? It doesn't actually help you in any, in any way. Uh. It doesn't have any benefits apart from the pleasure itself. It is... It is uh, it doesn't have any spiritual benefit. Uh, and this is what the idea of pointless means here, with sensual pleasures. Uh. And this is why you go through maybe a whole life, yeah, and you uh, live uh, an ordinary life as an ordinary person, and you enjoy yourself, and you have a nice house, and a nice car, and a nice family, and nice relationships, and you enjoy nice entertainment, and nice food, etc. Yeah, and as you do that, uh, even though you do all of that, uh, it doesn't feel as if there is any particular meaning to it. Uh, where is it all going? Well, actually, it's not really going anywhere. You're doing all of these things, and then you die. And then you think back and you think, why? Why? No. I, now it all has to go. What was the point? There is no point. That's the problem. Yeah, it's just enjoy. I mean, enjoyment is like a point in its own sake because it's good to enjoy. We have to enjoy our lives, uh, but there isn't any bigger picture. Uh, then you have to die. You have to give it everything up, and it's like a despairing moment uh, when you come to your deathbed. Everything you have worked for, uh, everything you have done in this life has to go, uh, and all of the things you did were kind of meaningless. Uh, imagine on your deathbed. Uh, I'll do a death contemplation later on, so you get a feeling for that sense, yeah? And see what it feels like. You have to feel it now, because now it is useful, because now it will give you a kind of impetus to do something, yeah? So this is what pointless means, yeah? And what is so interesting about it, of course, is that the vast majority of people in the world, they, all they do is these kind of pointless things. This is what people live for. Yeah? Actually, it's much worse than that, because it's much worse, because if all your life is, is about these pointless things, if that is what really matters to you, uh, if that is what you put at the top, uh, if that is what you live for, uh, then, and you forget about all spiritual things, uh, then you are going to do bad things in the pursuit of pointless things. Imagining doing bad things in the pursuit of pointless things, that's really quite even worse, right? That's really, that's kind of really depressing when you think about it that way. But that is the reality here. People do immoral things in the pursuit of sensual pleasures. That's what they do. They will cheat on their taxes, they will cheat on their business friends, they will uh, do, sometimes they will do even worse things, they will kill and they will do whatever and they will steal and they will lie, yeah, but especially when it comes to business, people are greedy or whatever it is. So you do all of this in pursuit of sensual pleasures and then it's even worse because then when you die, not only have you, or you have to give up all of those things that you cheated to get in the first place, but also you have built up all these, these negative qualities in your mind at the same time. Bad karma, negative feelings inside of you. And you can imagine where that leads in the future. Uh. So it's kind of really scary, this sensual realm. Yeah? It's kind of frightening because it tends to lead you astray in a really bad way. If you make this important, guaranteed, you will occasionally slip up and you will do immoral things. Uh, because the drive, the push of the essential pleasures is so strong uh, that it will 
force you into those ways and you end up doing something bad. Uh. So that's actually quite worrisome. Yeah. Are you sure you want to keep on keep on doing that? Uh? Is that a good idea? <laughs> So what should we do? So sometimes people become Buddhists and they think, oh yeah, now I'm going to become a real Buddhist, I'm going to throw out all the sensual pleasures and I'm going to live a really austere life, yeah? I'm not going to have any more entertainment, I'm going to eat simple food, rice and water. <laughs> oh, and your life becomes terrible, right? Your life becomes unbearable, it becomes unlivable because you have no happiness anymore. And sometimes I see Buddhists who are way too serious. They are so serious and they go on retreats and they kind of you know, look their eyes, they look tense and uncomfortable and they're kind of really kind of forcing themselves to live without any kind of happiness. That doesn't work either. Huh? So we have to be careful here. Yeah? On the one hand, sensual pleasures may be pointless. On the other hand, if you go too, too much to the other extreme, which is really here the Atta Kilamatanu Yoga, where you kind of give up everything straight away, you suffer too much huh? and life also is unbearable. Huh? So what is the right attitude? What is the right approach? Uh, and the right approach is not to throw out all the pleasures of life. Uh, if you do that, life is going to be absolutely bad. Uh, yeah? Instead, uh, what you do is you set certain limits on the sensual pleasures. This is really the first thing to do. Uh, and those limits that you set on the sensual pleasures are, first and foremost, is of course things like the five precepts. Uh, yeah. Are you able to live on the five precepts? Yeah? No? <laughs> yes? Okay, you are. Some of you are. Some of you seem a bit more uncertain. But So this is the foundation of Buddhism. Yeah? And this is why these five precepts are so important. They set boundaries uh, on your conduct. Uh, otherwise, sense pleasures is going to take you astray sometimes. Uh, you're going to start cheating other people. Uh, you're going to start lying even in the name of sensual pleasures uh, because you haven't got those boundaries. They're very useful as boundaries. Uh, so if you're not keeping the five precepts already, I would really recommend you to do that. It's a very useful thing to do. Huh? And it kind of is a starting point of your spiritual living a moral life, if you have that. Uh, take the moral life much, much further. Huh? Don't stop with the five precepts. Uh, I will talk much more about this later on, because it is, this is actually the really the foundational aspect of the whole path, is to understand how to live as morally as you possibly can, how to overcome anger and all of this is very, very important on the Buddhist path. Uh, but the foundation stone is right there, the five precepts. Uh, and if you can do that, uh, then you are already hindering some of the excess of sensual pleasure. Yeah? You're bounding it a little bit. Uh, and if you stay within that, then you're already doing really well. Yeah? You can give yourself a pat on the shoulder. Do you do that here at BDF, giving each other pat on the shoulder? Uh, you should do that, Bobby, yeah, in the future. You should, go, uh, you should kind of go lead the kind of that one and get well done. You keep in the five precepts, yeah? Sometimes we need a little bit of encouragement, yeah, because sometimes we forget that what we're doing actually is pretty good. Uh, yeah? <laughs> it's pretty good already, and we're doing that. And sometimes we don't rejoice enough in the good things that we're doing, uh, always finding fault. That's kind of the common thing in Buddhism. Uh, instead, rejoice that we're doing good things, uh, and then you b be on the right track. Yeah? So this is what you do. And remember the reason why we are trying to overcome this or reduce our indulgence in sensual pleasures is because we want to go to a higher pleasure. So the purpose here is that when you reduce your indulgence in this way, first by keeping the five precepts, then if you go on a proper meditation retreat, probably keeping the eight precepts, yeah, I guess many of you have sometimes kept the eight precepts. Yeah, you know what that is like. Yeah, it's not that hard. Yeah, it's not impossible. Uh, most people can do that with a little bit of perseverance. Uh, and then you're moving away a little bit further. Yeah, and then you really have a chance to experience deeper states of meditation. Why? Because you're moving away from the indulgence in the senses. Uh, and then you can actually experience more a deep meditation practice. So it's a kind of stage-wise thing. Uh, you start to learn how to enjoy the spiritual path. And this is why enjoyment of the spiritual path is so important. Uh, because if you get the enjoyment on the spiritual path, uh, it's easier to give up the lower pleasures. Uh, so it's a gradual thing. Yeah? Keep on enjoying your sensual pleasures in the world. Uh, yeah, don't worry too much about that. Uh, but occasionally, yeah, 
try some more meditation practice, living a more spiritual life. Uh, and it's like you're building up one and slowly, slowly reducing the other. Uh, and that is the right way of thinking about the essential pleasures versus uh, spiritual happiness. Uh, and when you do it in this way, it is not, you, you can't deal with it. Yeah, you know how to do it. You don't kind of yo-yo between one and the other, but you kind of have a more smooth journey. Uh, it's not always going to be easy. Sometimes you will encounter difficulties even if you do it this way, but it makes it a little bit easier because you're not too austere, you're not too kind of hardcore meditator, you're kind of more, uh, you understand the kind of that middle, beautiful middle way that the Buddha is talking about. Why is sensual pleasures a problem anyway? What, 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 I think it's, I, I've talked about this many times before here, but I think it's worthwhile really uh, remembering why it is a problem uh, and uh, the re reason why it is a problem first of all it makes you do immoral things like I mentioned before if you take it too far this is one problem uh, but the main problem is that it goes directly counter to deep meditation deep meditation and sensual pleasure are like 90 degrees on it you know to each other uh, and why is that uh, and the reason is because uh, this is an important point Many people don't get this point. You know, if you go to places like uh, you know, the United States or Europe or whatever, where they're all new to Buddhism, they don't really understand Buddhism at all, really. It's a miracle that I understand Buddhism because I came from those places as well, but gradually, slowly, slowly, you understand a bit more. But a lot of the time, what they want, they want both the meditation and the pleasures of the world. Yeah, they want to have both. This is why do I have to give up the sutta? Say you have to give up sensual. I don't want to give up sensual pleasures. Yeah, this is my happiness. I want to have both. This is the new age, two and a half thousand years after the Buddha. Things have changed. Now we want to have both. This is what people say. And what it means is they haven't really understood what is going on. And that's to be expected. You know, I mean, in the West, people are still trying to understand Buddhism. It's going to take a while before people have a good understanding in the. Uh, in the Western world. Uh, it's slowly happening, but it takes a bit of time. Uh, so, why is it problematic? And the reason why it is problematic is because if, as long as you are getting your happiness, your enjoyment through the five senses, uh, you're going to be attached to them. Uh, wherever you find happiness is where you're going to be attached. Uh, yeah, this is why we have attachments in the first place, because they give us happiness. We are attached to people, because those people are dear to us. They have a certain meaning to us. That's why we have attachments to people. That's why we have attachments to anything, including the five senses. So when you try to go into deep meditation and the senses start to fade away, there is going to be a resistance inside of you. It's going to block you from going deeper. The attachment is going to say, stop, you can't go any deeper than this. Why? Because you're not willing to give up seeing, you're not willing to give up hearing, you're not willing to give up even feeling the body. Uh, that is the main problem with sensual pleasures. Uh. But uh, it takes a while. You have to go quite deep in meditation before these problems really start to arise. Uh. For some people it arises earlier, for some later, depending on the kind of attachments you have. Uh. But this is why this is happening. Uh. So that's why when you go on a Meditation retreat, eight precepts, it can be very useful because it gives you a beginning point yeah, where you're letting go of the five senses uh, and moving towards the mind instead. Uh. So these are going in different direction. Meditation goes inward. Uh. You're letting go of the five senses. Uh. Sensual pleasure goes out towards into the world. You are enjoying the things outside. You are attached to those things. Uh. So they go in opposite directions, and that is why it is a problem. And that is why, ultimately, on the path of meditation, we have to move away from one to be able to fully experience the other one. Uh. You can see here, yeah, but again, allow it to happen naturally. Uh. Allow it to keep on doing, see the problem yourself, and allow it to happen fairly naturally. Uh. Put some constraints on the sensual pleasures uh, that stop you from taking it too far. Then you will be on the right track. Yeah. So uh, I'm saying this because I've seen too many examples of people being too austere, yeah, having miserable life. They don't look happy at all. It's supposed to be a path of happiness, Buddhism. It's not supposed to be a path of misery. You know, I always like to say to people that people have enough dukkha already. Is anyone here who hasn't got enough suffering? Do you want more suffering in your life? 
Okay, well, <laughs> everybody has enough suffering. Yeah, I mean, I am Buddhist monk. We're not supposed to have so much suffering. I have already. I have too much suffering as well. Thank you very much. I'd like to have even more happiness. <laughs> Why anyone? So that remember that the spiritual path is supposed to be something that gives something additional to your life, that makes your life better, not something that detracts from your life. <laughs> yeah, and then you're heading on the right path. Uh, people often think they have this idea that, well, if I suffer a lot now, then somehow down the track it will give rise to happiness. But actually it doesn't really work like that in Buddhism. Uh, you suffer a lot now, usually you suffer down the track as well. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, you have to learn to guide the mind in the right direction, uh, to learn to understand the real spiritual happiness right now. Then you will increase that as you go down the track. Uh, that is the right way of thinking about this. Uh, and the Buddha pretty much says that in the suttas. Uh. So that is the one extreme, yeah? And then the other extreme is indulgence in self-mortification, atta kilamata nu yoga. Uh, atta is like the self, uh, here referring mostly to the body. Kilamata is like uh, tiring the body, uh, yeah? Kilamata is to tire, to, to kind of waste away the body. You're allowing the body to waste away, that's what the Buddha did, uh, by becoming very thin and only eating one rice grain a day. Why is that bad? Because it is painful. Yeah? It's bad because it's painful, isn't that interesting? Uh, that's why it doesn't work. Uh, pain is a hindrance on the path. Uh, so we want to get away from too much pain. Pain is a problem. Dukkha is the Pali word there. And this gives, again, straight away, gives you a lot of information about how meditation is going to work. It is ignoble. In other words, it's like got nothing to do with the Aryan people, the noble ones. And again, it is pointless. It doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't take you to any goal. The only goal it takes you, if you take it too far, is death. But uh, we're not ready to die yet. We want to do something more with our lives, first of all. Uh, so don't go there straight away. Uh. But interesting, yeah? It is a problem because it is dukkha. This is a problem on the Buddhist path. Uh. So we don't want to create all that excessive dukkha. That dukkha is going to be a blockage uh, in the same way that too much bodily happiness is going to be a blockage, uh, in the same way too much bodily suffering is going to be a blockage. Why? Well, because uh, if you have too much happiness through the body, uh, you are going to attach to the happiness, the five senses and all of that. Uh, but if you have too much suffering through the body, still the mind is going to be interested in the body because the body is a problem for the mind. And as long as you have a lot of suffering in the body, the mind will go there uh, and it won't be able to find stillness inside as a consequence. Uh, the interest will be in the body because there's a problem to be overcome. That problem is called physical suffering. Yeah? And that's why you can't get rid of uh, the body. Yeah? So both sensual indulgence and self-torture, self-mortification, share many things in common. They are both problematic because the, of the interest in the body. In both cases, the attachment to the body, the interest in the body is the problem. Yeah? This is why both of these don't work. Uh, to be able to go deep in meditation practice, uh, you have to let go of the body, leave the physical body behind. Uh, that is really the only way. Uh. So this is like the discovery of the Buddha. This is a large part of what it's about. Yeah, the idea of the middle way, uh, uh, letting go of the physical body, that is, and that is done not through mortifying it or indulging it, uh, but by going inside, letting go of these things. Uh, yeah. So that is where it comes from. And this is, you may be surprised, maybe to many of you, this is kind of just common sense because uh, you've had teachers like Ajahn Brahm coming here for 20 years, yes, telling you to enjoy your meditation and all that. And uh, what a wonderful thing that I'm so happy I found Ajahn Brahm myself, you know. It's like a lottery, how you f what teacher you get in this world. Uh, and I feel so lucky, maybe I made some good karma in the past. Yeah, oh, maybe I did. Because, uh, you know, much better to have someone like Ajahn Brahm who teaches the happy path uh, than some of some other people who get this dukkha path and they practice that dukkha path. Oh, so much dukkha. Sometimes you feel so lucky. It's not ob it may be obvious to us, but actually large part of the Buddhist world, this is not obvious at all. And they I would say a lot of these people, they practice the Atta Kilamata Nu Yoga, whereby they torture their body, they say, sit one and a half hour. Okay, now you can have ten minute rest and then another one and a half hour, yeah? And then 
after those ten day retreat, uh, you never come back again because no way you're going to come back to that torture. Yeah, maybe a few people will benefit from that, but the vast majority will not because they're just not ready for that kind of meditation practice. Uh, and some of them they just keep on torturing themselves year after year. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so important, surprisingly important, surprising that even though this is the first teaching of the Buddha, we still have to keep reminding ourselves as Buddhists uh, not to go down that track uh, two and a half thousand years later on. Uh. So, uh, then the Buddha, what he discovered then is this middle way. Yeah, I mentioned before how he uh, achieved uh, the jhana experiences, uh, yeah, and that is really what that middle way is about. Uh. So the Buddha says then, avoiding these two extremes, uh, the realized one who woke up by understanding the middle way, which gives vision and knowledge, uh, leads to peace, direct knowledge, awakening and extinguishment. Uh, so that is the middle way, and of course that middle way we will see in a second is nothing other than the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, before we get to that, uh, uh, let's have another break here, and uh, we'll come back again at about 10.30 here. <laughs>